Hello and welcome to the Institute for Government for today's event on devolution and Scotland after the pandemic. My name is Akash Pound. I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute and I'm delighted to be hosting today's event on uh, the state of devolution in Scotland with John Swinney, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for COVID recovery. It's been a busy week actually for the devolution team here at the Institute. Just yesterday we hosted an event with Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midlands, and a video of that is up on our website for anyone who missed it. But today we are turning our attention a few hundred miles further north and uh, John is joining us live from Edinburgh, from the, the Scottish Parliament building, in fact, um, to, to, to deliver a speech on the state of devolution and then take questions um, from me and also from the live audience. So if you do have any questions um, that you'd like me to put to the Deputy First Minister, please add them in the Q&A function um, that you should find on your screen. Uh, Mr Swinney has been a member of the Scottish Parliament ever since its creation in 1999. I'm not sure how many survivors there are from the very first intake um, of, of, of MSPs, but um, you, are, you are one of them. Um, and uh, jo John's held a number of big important jobs in Scottish politics in the 22 years since then. Um, he had a period as leader of the SNP, um, he's also served in cabinet as the responsible minister for finance and the constitution, later for education and skills. Um, and then, as mentioned, since May of this year, he's taken on responsibility for COVID recovery alongside a set of cross government responsibilities and responsibility for intergovernmental relations and public service reform as well. So we're going to be hearing about um, some, but maybe not all of that wide set of responsibilities today. Um, in a few moments, I will hand over to Mr Swinney uh, for a speech that he's going to give for 20 minutes or so. Um, there'll then be plenty of time left for questions, um, as I say, both from me and from anyone who would like to contribute questions. If you do that, please, if you don't mind, say who you are, where you're from, and uh, you can also upvote other people's questions if you think they're, they're particularly worth me asking. Um, final bit of housekeeping from me is just to mention that we'll be uh, live tweeting this event from the IFG events account on Twitter. We'll be using the hashtag IFGDevo if you'd like to engage there. And uh, the video and audio of this event will be uploaded onto our website on YouTube and on our podcast channel over the next day or so. Um, so that's enough for me. It gives me great pleasure to introduce John Swinney. John, thank you very much for joining us. Really looking forward to your speech and the conversation that will follow. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Akash, and thank you for the invitation to contribute to this Institute for Government event. And let me get straight to the point. Uh, much to my regret, the United Kingdom government is engaged in a project of undermining good governance in these islands. And under the UK's constitution, there appears little anyone can do to stop them. That project exposes the fact that the UK is not what many people in Scotland believed or hoped it to be a partnership of equals. Instead of partnership, we have what is sometimes euphemistically called muscular unionism, but which in fact means Westminster control of Scotland, even perhaps especially in devolved areas. The Brexit campaign's favourite slogan, Take Back Control, has now been extended well beyond the context of the European Union question. It is also about the UK government taking back control from Scotland, from Wales, and from other institutions that prove an irritation to those now in charge of the United Kingdom government. Think of the attempt to prorogue Parliament, where, frustrated by being held to account for the unfolding disaster of Brexit, the Prime Minister preferred to do away with democratic accountability. That attempt was stopped in the courts, 
So no surprise to then find attacks on judges and on the rule of law, including threats to, the, to limit the ability of the citizen to hold the UK government to account through judicial review. Or think of plans to break international law and to renege on agreements only recently signed with the European Union. Or partisan changes to electoral law, including seeking to undermine the independence of the Electoral Commission by requiring it to deliver the UK government's priorities in relation to elections. Or incredibly, the persistent threat to repeal the Human Rights Act, an act which not only protects our most fundamental rights and freedoms, but one which is woven into the makeup of each of the devolution settlements in these islands. And of course, the UK government is undermining good governance through its attacks on devolution, starting almost immediately after the referendum in 2016. I campaigned for devolution. As an MP, I voted for the devolution acts in the House of Commons in 1998. I've been a parliamentarian, as Ash indicated, in a devolved parliament since 1999 and a minister in a devolved government since 2007. I sat on the Smith Commission, which in the wake of the independence referendum, secured cross-party support for a significant expansion of devolution. Devolution was the clear choice of the people of Scotland in 1997, and it has been good for Scotland. I believe that Scotland is better governed as a result of devolution, that Scotland is a fairer, wealthier, greener, more equal and more confident country. Of course, as a believer in Scottish independence, I've always been clear that for me, devolution is part of a home road journey that I hope will lead to, to independence. Other devolution supporters, of course, have a different view. But despite these differences, I remember the feeling of the very early days of that first Scottish Parliament in 1999. A sense was shared across the parliament, across the parties, that this was an opportunity to do things better. In the words of Donald Dewar, the first, first minister, in his speech at the opening of the parliament, that the establishment of the parliament meant that democracy was renewed in Scotland. Now it seems that for the UK government, democracy has been renewed a little bit too much for its liking. So it's determined to turn back the clock. The UK government is using something that people in Scotland voted overwhelmingly against, Brexit, to hollow out something they voted overwhelmingly for, the Scottish Parliament. Whether for or against independence, those of us who campaigned to establish the Scottish Parliament shared, I think, broad agreement on three things. Firstly, that devolution was about making Scotland's government more democratic. A proportional system of voting means that Scotland gets the parliament it voted for and encourages consensus building and collaboration between parties in parliament. That has been the case for much of the parliament's life. It is not always the case and that spirit of collaboration is sometimes challenged and it feels challenged at the present environment. But for the SNP, my party, for our part, and the Scottish Green Party, we've decided to enter into an innovative and ambitious cooperation agreement, a deal that saw the first Green Ministers appointed to government anywhere in the United Kingdom. Compare that with the reality of democracy at Westminster, where party donors get seats in the legislature for life and jobs as ministers. Secondly, devolution was about encouraging innovation and policy in these islands, recognising that different conditions in the nations of the UK will demand different solutions. It was this drive to innovate that led Scotland to deliver free personal care, the UK's first smoking ban, minimum unit pricing for alcohol, and laws that protect breastfeeding women and provide free period products in Scotland. And finally, devolution was about building an institution that had the power to keep the people of Scotland safe, to some extent at least, from the decisions of UK governments that we did not vote for. We cannot do everything with our current powers, but we have been able, for example, to keep university education free, to resist the creeping privatisation of the National Health Service and to mitigate the cruelty of the bedroom tax in Scotland. When you see what devolution is for, you can see why the UK government wants to undermine it. All of these things are threats to the UK government and to its view of the world, 
a world in which taking back control means keeping control in one place and one place only, and that is in its own hands. The intolerance of the devolved nations making their own decisions or having their own point of view can be seen in any number of developments over recent years, but the primary cause of this has been Brexit, and in particular the UK government's decisions since the vote in 2016. Scotland did not vote to leave the European Union, but we were taken out. After the vote, the Scottish Government made the case for staying in the single market and put forward compromise proposals for retaining Scotland's and indeed the UK's place within it, but these were ignored. And last year, because of the pandemic, we called for the extension of the transition period, but that call too was dismissed. During the last five years, we've seen the withering of the institutions of effective intergovernmental relations and a complete refusal to engage in any serious way with the other governments in these islands over Brexit. We saw the views of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Senate uh, on legislation repeatedly ignored, even when the UK government itself accepted, as it was bound to, that their consent was required. And we saw the passage of an act that the Labour First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, has called an unacceptable and unconstitutional encroachment into the established devolution settlement. The Internal Market Act, I believe, tells us a great deal about the nature of power in the United Kingdom and the way all UK governments ultimately work. Instead of an arrangement based on recognition of each other's areas of competence, interest and expertise, on trust and agreement, and which built on existing rules, we got the opposite. A system where the UK government alone decides that an internal market act is required, where the UK government alone decides the rules of the internal market, where the UK government alone decides on exceptions to its own rules and on how disputes are to be handled, and where the UK government alone decides whether to follow the constitutional convention that requires Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to consent to such legislation, or whether simply to ignore that too. The UK government argues that the Act merely applies commonly understood concepts like mutual recognition and non-discrimination to the UK's specific constitutional arrangements following Brexit. This is not the case. The European single market tempers the applications of the principles of mutual recognition and non-discrimination with principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. The UK's Internal Market Act, by contrast, imposes a rigid system with very limited exceptions and with no consideration of the UK's inbuilt constitutional and economic imbalances. It is the assertion of brute centralising political power in the guise of even-handed market management. Its primary purpose is to constrain the choices of the devolved governments and legislatures and diminish alternative centres of de decision making and power within the United Kingdom. Professor Stephen Wetherill, in a recent article in the Yearbook of European Law, accurately identifies the reason for this. The Internal Market Act, he says, envisages a more deregulatory model in the UK than is to be found in the EU. This is important. The Act is not intended simply to protect existing markets within the UK or to provide a neutral mechanism to coordinate regulation. It is a deregulatory mission that will enable a race to the bottom for product standards and safety, and it is not one that Scotland has at any stage signed up to. That points to something even more fundamental that distinguishes the EU internal market from the UK's. It lies in the way these two internal markets were developed and are implemented. The EU's internal market rules are there in the treaties, signed up to by every member state and developed on the basis of co-decision and dialogue in laws passed according to the democratic processes of the European Union. The EU's internal market was established and is maintained by consent with the participation and agreement of those bound by its rules and according to the rule of law. None of that can be said for the UK's Internal Market Act. It was imposed on the nations of the United Kingdom. The Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Senate and the Northern Ireland Assembly all withheld consent to it. The rules in the Act can be changed by ministerial fiat without the, cons the consent of the devolved nations. 
As Professor Weatherall put it, the act is an expression of London's belligerent refusal to engage cooperatively with Scotland and Wales. England's economic dominance within the UK, coupled to the vigour of the Act's market access principles, make it likely that the Act will exert a powerful chilling effect over new regulatory initiatives preferred by Scotland and Wales. The Internal Market Act subverts the idea that devolution was there to allow different conditions to lead to different, better solutions. It puts a break on the possibilities of devolution as a source of policy innovation and experimentation. And it prevents those institutions actually elected by the people of Scotland from making effective decisions for Scotland, as well as defending them from the consequences of UK government policy decisions, even when those decisions relate to entirely devolved powers. Does anyone seriously think that an innovation like minimum unit pricing for alcohol, which let's remind ourselves after hearing all the evidence and arguments the courts held to be compatible with EU law, would have been possible if the Internal Market Act had been in place at that time? Just last week, as part of our actions to tackle the climate emergency, we introduced a ban on some of the most problematic single-use plastic items in Scotland. The ban is a huge step forward in the fight against plastic waste, littering Scotland's coast and polluting our oceans. But what should be seen as an example of Scotland leading with this important ban is instead an example of the way the Internal Market Act rides roughshod over devolution. The Act effectively exempts any items that are produced or imported via another part of the United Kingdom meaning the ban is ineffective without UK ministers and them alone deciding whether to grant an exclusion under the Act. Control well and truly taken back. And the Internal Market Act doesn't stop at undermining devolved legislation. It also gives UK ministers new powers to decide how public funds are spent in devolved policy areas like education, culture and sport. These are decisions that have been and should be taken by the Parliament and Government voted for, by and accountable to people in Scotland. It is a recipe for policy incoherence and poor value for money. No wonder Lord Hope of Craighead, the first Deputy President of the UK Supreme Court, concluded that devolved powers are rendered worthless by the Act, or that the Scottish Trade Union Congress called the Act a free pass for the UK government to undermine the ability of the Scottish Parliament to do things like in implement a fair work agenda or to improve environmental or food standards. Is this how a partnership of equals behaves? What successful partnership begins with one party considering itself the sole decision maker, able to dictate terms to the others and ignore their views if it chooses? How can trust necessary to make a success of any relationship ever be built in such circumstances? All of this is just yet more evidence of the fundamental truth at the heart of the UK Constitution. It cannot stand any source of real power other than the UK Government and Westminster. The Scottish constitutional tradition holds that the people are sovereign and that governmental power is held on trust from them and exercised with their consent. In the United Kingdom, it is Westminster that is sovereign and there is only one real source of power, the government of the day's majority in the House of Commons. Parliamentary sovereignty is an absolute idea. It means that Parliament can make or unmake any law and that nothing can come in Parliament's way as far as lawmaking is concerned. Even when power and responsibility has been devolved, parliamentary sovereignty remains and can prevent the Scottish Parliament, for example, applying children's rights across all areas of devolved law, as we found out in the recent decision of the, of the UK Supreme Court. Power devolved, ultimately, is power retained. I began by suggesting that the actions of the UK government were undermining good governance, and they are, but they also reveal something about the UK's constitution, because these actions are not illegal. The UK has a constitution that allows the UK government to behave in this way. What the last few years demonstrates is that the successful operation of the devolution settlement 
in the first 16 or so years of devolution was not because the votes in the referendums in 1997 were being respected or because the UK government had actually become a partnership or of equals or because power had meaningfully been shared among the nations. It was simply because UK governments of the day, for the most part, showed some self-restraint. I'm not sure anyone would regard self-restraint as being one of the hallmarks of the current UK government. Indeed, what the process of Brexit and the passage of the Internal Market Act have shown us is that even if a future UK government were elected that had a more enlightened approach to devolution than the current administration, then this would not make the, de the devolved settlement safe. Devolution would only ever be one election away from de being dismantled again. Political unions do not have to be like this. Partnership is possible. Compare the solidarity and support shown to Ireland by the 26 other countries of the European Union with the, dismal, dis with the dismissal by the UK government of the views of the Scottish government, the Scottish parliament and indeed the people of Scotland. As I've set out, even in an area as central to the European project as the free movement of goods, the EU has shown itself capable of sharing power, recognising different national priorities and respecting the principle of subsidiarity, that power should rest at the lowest appropriate level. That sort of approach, respectful, tolerant, multilateral, democratic, is what, is going, is what it is going to take to deal with global challenges like recovery from the pandemic or the fastest possible just transition to net zero. But I'm afraid that such an approach to government is not possible within the United Kingdom. The constitutional lawyer and academic Sir Ivor Jennings had a warning for those of us with a constitutional proposition to put to the people. He said a constitution is but a means to an end and the end is good government. I've set out my reasons for believing that the actions of the current UK government across a number of fronts, including devolution, are undermining good governance in these islands. But my argument goes further than that. I believe that the UK's constitution and the central place it affords the sovereignty of Parliament inhibits good government regardless of the party in power. What else could you conclude from a constitution that allows a government to simply decide on its own to repeal human rights protection, to restructure electoral laws, to make itself immune from challenge in the courts or to repudiate international treaties, or which allows a government formed by a party that has not won an election in Scotland since the 1950s to undermine a devolution settlement overwhelmingly voted for by the people of Scotland or to take powers from, a, powers from a parliament elected by the people of Scotland under a system of voting far fairer than that which elects the Westminster Parliament or which says that it recognises the right of the people of Scotland to choose the form of government best suited to their needs but which does not put beyond doubt the ability of the people who live in Scotland to vote to exercise that right. During the last independence referendum, we were promised not just a partnership in the UK, but that Scotland could lead the United Kingdom. What we have experienced has, of course, been very far from that. Indeed, I think it has been demonstrated that a partnership of equals would never be possible given the operation of Westminster parliamentary sovereignty. The Scottish Government is keen to work in partnership, but how can there be a proper partnership when one party has to rely on the other's exercising of self-restraint if it is to participate? When one party ignores the rules that are supposed to govern their relationship, when the democratic mandates of one are simply dismissed without discussion by the other? When even the very nature of the nations that are part of the supposedly voluntary union is doubted by one side, with the Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack recently declaring that he would prefer to describe the UK as enjoying regional differences rather than consisting of four nations. True partnership would have to involve a guarantee that each party recognised and respected each other's responsibilities, interests and rights, while celebrating the benefits that come when we share sovereignty and work together. With nationhood, this is possible, as Ireland and as other small nations have shown in the European Union and on the world stage. The next referendum on Scottish independence, and there will be one, 
That decision was taken by the people of Scotland in May of this year. The next referendum on Scottish independence will not be a choice between the status quo and a constitutional unknown. There will be no status quo anymore. We are in the middle of a dramatic restructuring of our democracy and our economy, whether we like it or not. Instead, it will be between two competing visions of our future. One, of an independent new nation in Europe, where the people of Scotland have control over their futures and where their decisions count, and one of a dependent Scotland in a diminished United Kingdom where the people of Scotland's choices can be ignored and overturned if they don't suit the priorities of a government they didn't vote for. I know which vision appeals to me. I know which vision is equal to the aspirations of people today. And I know which has what it takes to meet at the singular moment the challenges that face Scotland and that all nations face at this present moment. Thank you, Akash, and I look forward to our conversation this month. John, thanks very much. I thought that was a, a really clear and, and powerful speech, and it, it conveyed very, uh, but very clearly the, the sense of frustration that you and I know others in the Scottish government feel about um, the, the current UK government's approach to, to devolution and the constitution. So, um, yes, I think that sets us up very nicely for a conversation over the next um half an hour and uh slightly more than that so thank you i can see we've had lots of questions uh coming in already from from the audience and i'll do my best to to incorporate as many of those as possible um into our conversation um but i want to start um before i do that by talking a bit about the the UK government strategy for the union if if if, if that's what we might call it and as as you said um, is often described as uh, muscular muscular unionism, um, though you said that was perhaps a euphemism from your perspective. But <laughs> anyway, my question for you is, I mean, you said yourself in, in, in your speech that for you, devolution represents part of a journey, a home rule journey, I think, as you put it, towards eventual independence. And, and that's obviously your um, ultimate objective. But that, of course, is also the concern of people in the UK government. So I just wonder, can you understand why UK ministers might have come to this decision that they actually need to take a more assertive approach to demonstrating the value of the union, for instance, by spending more money in the devolved nations directly, rather than passing on the money through the Barnet formula and so on to Scottish and, and also in Wales and Northern Ireland ministers to spend themselves? I, I, I can see the, 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 the pattern and the rationale that's been taken forward. Uh, I think it's fundamentally flawed because it essentially, I think, runs against the tide of public opinion within Scotland. If you look back over the, 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 the history of devolution, um, in, in 1997, uh, 1998, um, a, a proposition was put to the people of Scotland and legislated for, which um, involved the devolution of really quite a significant range of powers to the people of Scotland uh, and to the through the establishment of a Scottish Parliament. That was overwhelmingly endorsed by the public in Scotland in a referendum, um, a, a level of endorsement that I think surprised even the most ardent supporters of devolution in 1997. That was judged by many, I think, to be well, it was, devolution was described by the late John Smith as the settled will of the Scottish people. And I think many people judged that was it. And then, of course, in 2007, my party was elected to government. The uh, parties that support you know, the UK political parties established the Kalman Commission and the Kalman Commission recommended further powers to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Indeed, actually, to be fair, in the period between 1999 and 2007, there were a number of actions by the then UK Labour government that further devolved powers, particularly over transport regulation to Scotland, um, which they undertook uh, you know, without much fanfare, to be, to, to be fair to them, uh, because it made rational sense to undertake that devolution. Um, the Kalman Commission, of course, was followed by the, it was designed to address that aspiration for more power in Scotland. And then, of course, the SNP government was returned with an overall majority in 2011. 
it led to the independence referendum, um, which was in itself a recognition by the Cameron government of the desire of the people of Scotland to determine their own future. And I, you know, I applaud David Cameron and his colleagues at that moment for respecting the democratic will of the people of Scotland. But in the aftermath of the referendum, the Smith Commission on which I sat recommended a further set of even more dramatic powers coming to the Scottish Parliament and they were subsequently legislated for and implemented. So my, my now, and even beyond that, what have we seen? Well, we've seen the SNP returned with um, a strong support in 2016 and 63 seats uh, elected in 2016 and in 2021 elected with 64 seats and with there being an overall majority in the parliament with our colleagues in the Green Party in favour of Scottish independence um, uh, and a referendum on that question. So my, my whilst I understand what the UK government is trying to do, I think they're just swimming against a tide because their, 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 their approach is, is I think will have the effect of aggravating opinion within Scotland because the people in Scotland want their institutions to be able to, um, to the majority of the people in Scotland want their democratic institutions to be able to take their decisions, for them to hold those institutions to account. And they, they, they want those institutions to be respected. And the UK government is essentially taking a set of actions that are not acting in, 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 in that spirit. They are appealing to a minority of opinion within Scotland uh, on this question. And I think they, they run the risk of aggravating opinion within Scotland and leading, as I say, at a technical level to poor value for money uh, outcomes and policy incoherence into the bargain. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, th I do think that's a, that's a plausible hypothesis and it's, it's something we'll, well, we'll certainly be watching closely as over, over the coming years at the Institute for Government, how, how, how these decisions do impact on, on both public opinion and good or otherwise uh, policy being being delivered. OK, uh, let's I, I'd like to move on to um, UK Internal Markets Act, which you, you, you spoke, of course, um, quite a bit about and set out um, some pretty uh, strong, strong criticisms you have of that legislation. Um, the UK government counter argument, of course, would be that Brexit did change the context in which devolution operated in quite a, a fundamental way and without EU law uh, to provide that common set of rules within the, the single market, the risk was that we would see regulatory divergence and therefore the emergence of barriers to trade effectively between the nations of the UK. So I understand that there's provisions of the UKIM Act and the way the UKIM Act was was pushed through and so on that that that, that you um, disagree with quite quite fervently. But do you accept that there was that risk there in terms of the operation of the UK market um, that therefore required some kind of legislative solution? I think there's, there's, two, there's two stages to answering that question, Akash. The, the, the first is that um, I I can acknowledge that um, the departure from the European Union, notwithstanding all the caveats I put in about the fact that Scotland never voted for the proposition, and, and you know, so let me just, for, for, for the sake of time, just reiterate those caveats. Um, I, I can understand the necessity for, or the argument for uh, some a degree, you know, a theoretical argument for some degree of regulation of the internal market within the United Kingdom. I can see the theoretical rationale for that, but that runs entirely contrary to the existence of devolution, because devolution accepts in principle the notion of regulatory divergence. It accepts in principle that by establishing a set of devolved responsibilities that are the subject of accountability to, in our case, the Scottish Parliament. It's exactly the same situation in the Welsh Senate. And the, and the points that I'm going to talk about today 
are exactly the same arguments that the First Minister of Wales has made on behalf of the Welsh Senate, which, which he's well supported in the Welsh Senate on his concerns. But essentially, the, that, that whole theoretical notion runs contrary to the question of devolution. So the fact that the Internal Market Act was embarked upon is, in my view, an explicit statement by the UK government of its intent to undermine devolution. So I don't think there can be any dispute about that. That was the purpose of the exercise. It was to constrain the ability of the devolved parliaments, legislators, to take different decisions and to apply different regulatory approaches. And that is one of the fundamental purposes of devolution. So the theoretical necessity for, an, for internal market legislation contains that attack on devolved legislators. So that's the first point of principle. The second, or the, or the, the first phase of the argument. The second phase of the argument is if you accept, well, okay, there has to be some form of regulatory, there has to be some form of internal market regulatory environment, then the way the UK government has gone about setting that up is essentially to put Westminster in the dominant position of deciding what that's going to be. So it's not of a similar character to uh, the European single market, where the European single market is created by consensus about member states coming together into an agreed proposition. So if you put that into a UK context, the nations of the United Kingdom coming together into a consensus uh, based position that's not what we've, that's not what the Internal Market Act does. The Internal Market Act allows the UK government to essentially hem in the properly devolved powers of the Scottish Parliament. It allows the UK government to spend in Scotland over the heads of the Scottish Parliament, same position in Wales, um, in devolved areas of responsibility. So um, it's you know it, it's just. That the whole nature of the legislation is an, is an attack on the concept of devolution because it you know there's absolutely no necessity, none whatsoever, for the UK Internal Market Act to contain the provisions to spend over the heads of the Scottish Parliament in devolved areas. There is no need for that to be in the internal market legislation whatsoever. Yes. The internal market legislation was used as a juggernaut to drive its way through the devolved settlement, using Brexit as the excuse, which we didn't vote for, to impose a system of establishing an internal market that is that is determined by Westminster, and it contains provisions that go right over the heads of the Scottish Parliament. So um, yeah. I, can, I can see the theoretical rationale, but it's been used as a Trojan horse um, for an attack on devolution. OK, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly remember being surprised myself when the, that legislation was published to see the the financial assistance powers, that, that the ones you're referring to, that have given UK ministers this new ability to spend money in what have basically been fully devolved areas uh, throughout the period of devolution. OK, let's move on. We've got lots and lots of questions and not enough time. Um, some really interesting points um, and, 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 and questions being made. So I want to put a couple of questions to you on uh, from from the audience that relate to um, well relate to intergovernmental relations so you painted quite a bleak picture of of the state of, of, of relations between UK and devolved governments um, so there's a couple of questions that have been put to us by someone or probably two people anonymous um, one is that well, given that you, you, the SNP ultimately seeks independence for Scotland, do you not actually have an incentive to, to give the perception that devolution and intergovernmental relations does not work? Do, do you actually have the incentive to make this stuff work, um, is, is, is the question there. And then secondly, slightly different one, do you have any examples that in your view represent good ways of working at official level between the governments? And so is there anything that officials could be doing to foster better working? 
Um, I think on the first point, um, I think if if I was the only person making this argument about the state of intergovernmental relations, then the, 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 I, I could understand the, the, the substance behind the question, but I'm not the only one making this argument. This argument has been made um, very forcibly by the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, um, a Labour First Minister who supports the Union. Um, and Mark Drakeford, I think, has been very clear and explicit about the deterioration in intergovernmental working um, under the current government. Now, it hasn't always been like this. Um, I, I've been a government minister now for 14 years, um, uh, for a very brief period, um, very, very brief period. Um, actually, I think it's only a matter of days. We, um, were, um, we worked with the Blair government, we then worked with the Brown government, the Cameron government, the May government, and now the Johnson government. And their uh, intergovernmental relations are at their worst in the current context um, of all that era. Uh, so although I support independence, I, I, I've got an obligation as a government minister to act effectively and wisely to take decisions on behalf of people in Scotland, to deliver good governance in Scotland. So I, I recognise the need to work with other um, with other governments, um, but I but what I've set out today is, in my view, a fair and accurate distillation of the experience that we have of intergovernmental working, and it is poor. Um, the, 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 the second question asked, asked about examples of good working, and th there are in specific policy questions um, examples where uh, governments have worked well together. Um, I think there have been a number of examples during the pandemic over um, you know, vaccine strategies and testing strategies where there has been good um, uh, working at a practical level between ministers and officials. And I think civil servants try very hard to try to create that framework and that climate, but it's not always possible to do that within the political context in which we operate. So there are some examples, but the general tenor of, um, uh, of, of the environment just now is poor and characterised by the um, what I would call a sort of um, just a sort of tokenistic degree of engagement with the devolved governments um, by the UK government and some particular examples of manifest hostility of which the Internal Market Act is probably the strongest uh, and, and clearest example. OK, great. Um, all right, so we are going to come on to um, independence uh, and and and, and uh, what may happen next in that regard in a few minutes. Before we get there, just a quick a couple of quick questions on COVID strategy. So Michael Simmons of The Spectator um, asks, or well, he says, earlier this month you said there was no evidence that vaccine passports worked because it was impossible to segment the data, but now you may be rolling them out further. Has new evidence come to light? And if not, I'm, I'm, I'm reading his question, how does this tie in with evidence-based policy? What I'd say to Michael is that the I think what is difficult, and the, the point that he latches on to is some comments that I made that I, you know, I think are, are entirely fair comments. There is, it's not possible to directly ascribe um, a, a, an inextricable co connection between one policy intervention and a particular outcome when it comes to the pandemic. You know, we have a basket of measures in place which are designed to provide um, baseline protection to the population in the pandemic. I can't say that X percentage of uh, virus suppression is attributable to this particular policy intervention. But what we can see uh, about the rollout of vaccine certificates is that when we announced that policy in early September, 
About 53% of our 18 to 29 year old population were vaccinated. When you look at that position now, that's now over 68%. So I would contend that in the population group that we were most targeting with the vaccine certification proposals in the um, uh, in its original form, were designed uh, we were designed to make the greatest impact. We are seeing a substantive impact on vaccination levels arising as a consequence. So that to me um, illustrates that vaccine certificates have a role to play as part of a basket of measures that are necessary to protect the public. And what we're looking at um, as we look to what is undoubtedly going to be a very challenging period over winter, where we are trying to avoid the um, the development of even greater pressure than we already are experiencing in our National Health Service, um, there may be further measures that we have to take and extending the scope and the scale, the range of vaccine certification may be uh, a justifiable uh, development for us to take place. But the government's obviously consulting on that just now and that will be the subject of announcement to, of the conclusions of that process to Parliament next Tuesday. OK, thanks. Right. One more COVID question, which actually then segues into discussion of independence. So has COVID not helped to make the case for the union in Scotland? So we have a question. Yeah, this is from Andy, who uh, suggests that yeah, COVID essentially has demonstrated that Scotland benefits from the union specifically. Is it not the case that things like the furlough scheme, the vaccine rollout have only been viable due to the size and the strength of the union? I don't think that conclusion can be arrived at. You know, fur furlough was able to be delivered, not because there was a big war chest that uh, the UK government was able to go in and access. It was because the UK government had the powers to undertake the borrowing necessary to support furlough. And of course, the Scottish Parliament doesn't have those powers. So, and, and, and countless other countries around the world, large and small, have had to embark on furlough style schemes to put in place the protection for the public. And um, so I think there's a, 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 a and you know, there's, there's obviously a huge amount of scientific development work that is undertaken across the globe in many countries around questions of, of, of vaccines where um, uh, countries are able to support their scientific community to enable the development of such propositions. So I don't think the, I don't think these are inherently um, unique developments that uh, can be ascribed to the constitution of the United Kingdom. I think the other dimension is, I think, to reflect on what are the attitudes of people in Scotland to the handling of COVID and fundamentally, I think all the, the public polling evidence indicates that people in Scotland generally felt more comfortable and more confident hearing their information and their feedback and their guidance about issues in relation to COVID coming from the Scottish Government and not the United Kingdom Government. And I think the, the way in which we have engaged directly and openly with the public through the dialogue that principally the First Minister has taken forward, but uh, which a number of us have been involved in, to engage in that direct communication with the public to provide them with assurance and guidance at what are clearly very anxious and difficult times for all of the members of the public, that people took a lot of confidence out of the way in which that was handled. Uh, the regulatory environments were put in place, the regulatory constraints were put in place, the measures that were undertaken to ensure that people remain safe. And it was quite interesting going out during the election campaign that we had in, in May. Um, we obviously had a, a more um, condensed period for dialogue with the public, but I was very struck when I went out to speak to constituents uh, uh, in, in my usual period of electioneering to hear their feedback about how strongly they felt their guidance and their leadership had come from the Scottish Government. So I think the pandemic demonstrates that 
people look to the government that most matters to them for their guidance and assurance. And for people in Scotland, that was overwhelming the, the Scottish government to whom they turned. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Well, let's um, let's move on then for the for the final period to, to talk about independence. So, um, I mean, you mentioned actually in your last answer that the UK government was able to implement the furlough scheme because of its ability to to borrow on the on the financial markets. In the event that independence happens, and if we have time, we might talk about how and whether you can get there. But in the event that it were to happen, is the SNP policy to, as per the Sustainable Growth Commission recommendations of a couple of few years ago, to adopt sterling as its currency, but this would not be a formal currency union. This would be a sort of dollarization, sterlingization kind of approach. And if so, wouldn't that actually make it quite hard for, for Scotland to, to borrow money internationally? And also you wouldn't have an independent monetary policy. So you'd lack some of those levers to respond to the kind of shocks that we saw with COVID. Uh, our, our policy position is that at uh, the moment Scotland becomes independent, uh, we would utilise sterling, not in a, a, a currency union, but um, to, to access sterling as any, um, uh, as any country is able to do so um, uh, as the currency. Uh, and over a period of time to assess the conditions that would enable us to move from using sterling to using uh, a currency that was a Scottish currency. Uh, so over a period of time, we would move to uh, a position of having the range of monetary powers that would go alongside the range of fiscal powers that we would uh, acquire on Scotland becoming an independent country. So there is a, a question of transition that is part of that process. But I think the key point is that when Scotland becomes independent, Scotland becomes able to exercise a much wider degree of fiscal flexibility and discretion that is, than is possible under the current arrangements of the United Kingdom, where essentially fiscal policy is uh, reserved, to, as is monetary policy, reserved to the United Kingdom government. And we don't have the ability to, to, to utilise some of that flexibility and that scope to enable us to act in a distinctive fashion that addresses the needs of people within Scotland. So the, 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 there, is a, there is a question of a, 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 transition, a transition phase that is there, but of course establishing sterling as the currency of an independent Scotland at the beginning of independence um, is, a, is a means of establishing that a stability that enables an independent Scotland to take its first steps and to begin to exercise fis a distinctive fiscal responsibility. OK, OK, thanks. Um, all right, so we've got another, well, several questions actually about uh, aspects of independence. So one comes from um, Hollywood, uh, Joseph Anderson at Hollywood Magazine who asks, is it SNP policy for an independent Scotland to rejoin the EU? Well, I, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, if so, how would you enforce checks on goods across the England-Scotland border? Uh, just something the Institute for Government has published a paper on um, earlier this year, incidentally. And relatedly, uh, Lord Soley, Clive Soley, um, well, he essentially asks the same question and I've lost where it is. But yeah, what, what would be the impact of Scotland joining the EU on trade across the Anglo-Scottish border? Uh, on the, the, the first question that, that was asked there, um, would a, an independent Scotland uh, want to rejoin the European Union? Yes, is the answer to that question. Uh, we think that uh, our interests are best served by establishing a positive and cooperative relationship with other European nations. I think the current environment around about these questions, uh, I think rather demonstrates that, uh, that point. Um, in relation to questions about trade between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, um, obviously there would have to be some 
negotiation with the UK government on the arrangements to, to be applied. And many of these are material to some of the issues that are currently being wrestled with us at this moment in relation to the aftermath of, um, uh, of Brexit. But fundamentally, what we would want to undertake is the creation of a constructive trading relationship between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. There are, of course, mutual interests in making sure that is the case because of the flow of goods both um, north, uh, uh, from the north and from the south across the border. And we would want to make sure that there was um, a smooth and negotiated arrangement in place to enable that to be the case. And we would be committed to ensuring that could be undertaken within the context of the commitments we make to uh, the that we would make to the European Union, but we would be prepared to make to a successor United Kingdom government in ensuring the ability to have good open trade flows uh, that would be able to be continued post independence. OK, great, thanks for that. Um, right, so if possible, um, I'd like to squeeze in two final questions, if if we can do that. Um, so the first is from uh, Nicola McEwen Edinburgh, from Edinburgh University, um, who asks specifically about the long running review of intergovernmental relations. Um, so what are the barriers in the way to completing that and what would have to change um, in order for the Scottish government to sign up for the proposed reforms, which I add on the face of it, could be part of the, the, the way to build something more like a partnership um, that, that you said you're in favour of? I think what, we'd, what, what really will, will answer that question from uh, Professor McEwen is, 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 is do we have sufficient confidence that there is a meaningful set of arrangements on uh, uh, being proposed that will be reinforced by ministerial um, uh, actions and approaches that will enable uh, a, an equal relationship and an equal partnership to be constructed. Now, you know, I, I don't think uh, I went through at length in my speech the nature of the, the approach of current UK ministers as being compatible with that, because the self-same UK ministers that are trying to say to us, let's have a partnership of equals and better intergovernmental relations are the UK ministers that have undermined the devolution settlement in the fashion that they have with the Internal Market Act. So I think we have to see some development of substance in the way in which the relationship has changed for it to be a more respectful partnership of equals. And it is currently a significant distance away from that. OK. OK, thank you. And uh, very finally, then, I mean, this is an enormous issue to open up in the in the last two minutes of an event. Um, but there's a few questions um, which I won't read out in full, but all get at the same, um, basically asking the same question, which is, is there any alternative to independence, which we know is your preference, but that could um, be a solution to some of these problems and that might mark a sort of compromise middle ground, a written constitution, something more like federalism or Devo Max. Um, people have used different terminology, but um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I think of, of, of course there is a, there, there are alternatives. Um, and, the, and the key question would be, would they satisfy people in Scotland? So if you go back to the history that I went through, and I, I won't repeat it all, but you know, 1998 Scotland Act, Calman Commission, Smith Commission, these all resulted in more powers being transferred to the Scottish Parliament. But back in May, the SNP was returned to government on a commitment to have a referendum on the independence question with the largest number of votes ever recorded for any party in the devolution elections and with more seats in the 2021 elections than we got in 2016. So I simply say that all this, you know, I, I read all the discussion about other propositions. Gordon Brown promised us that we'd be living in a federal state 
in the days leading up to the 2014 referendum if we voted no, and we're nowhere near, we're, not in a, we're, we're in a disrespectful state now. So the, the, all of these different ideas have got to take into account what's the mood and the attitude of the people of Scotland. And I don't think those developments would satisfy the mood of the people of Scotland who want to be independent. OK, thanks for, 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 for giving us such a concise answer to such a big question. Um, that does bring us to uh, to noon, to the to the end of um, this event. Um, John, let me just say again, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for, for doing the event, giving the speech. Um, I think it's been really uh, insightful and, and, and very, very useful, I'm sure, to all the people watching. Um, apologies to all those people whose questions I couldn't ask. There were some big topics that we didn't really have time to get into, including exactly what we expect to happen over the coming months and years um, as the Scottish government seeks to make um, an independence referendum actually happen. I'm sure the Institute for Government will be talking more about that, as of course will, will the Scottish Government. So keep an eye out for more content, events and so on on that topic. Thank you all for joining us and uh, goodbye. <laughs>